Yeah. All right, there we go, Scott. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Good morning. Thanks for being here. I'm going to be talking about making effective pesticide applications. As you mentioned, my name is Scott Brethauer. I'm with the Department of Ag and Biological Engineering at the U of I. I work with all things related to pesticide application technology. Work with both ground and aerial application. All right, if I step out here, can, can everybody hear me all right? Okay, good. I don't like standing at a podium. All things related to application, both ground and aerial, but I probably spend about 70% of my time both research and outreach working with aerial application. That's the one thing I really enjoy specializing in. Work with nozzles, spray setups, and then adjuvants. So I'm going to start out talking, basically kind of state the obvious. When we're making an application, what are our goals? Number one goal, control the targeted pest. It's obvious, but I bring it up because we're going to talk about a secondary goal, drift reduction. And in a lot of cases, we hear so much about drift reduction, we start to focus our application on that, and we forget about this one. So getting an effective application, we want to get the right pesticide to the right target area in the right amount. Calibration and mixing. We're gonna make sure our equipment is set up to deliver the right amount of spray, and when we mix that tank up, we get the right amount in there. I'm not gonna spend any time talking about them, but those do play a role. Coverage and deposition are key. This is what I'm gonna focus in on here for the next 50 minutes or so. We want to make sure when we spray the target, we get good coverage and we that spray deposits on the target area. This is related to the spray application rate, how many gallons I spray per acre, and the droplet size. If you're not sick of hearing about droplet size, you will be at noon. <laughs> we also want to mitigate misapplications. This is the flip side. And I'm going to be pretty much focused in on that drift down there, the off-target movement of the spray droplets. But uh, wrong product, wrong field. You think, well, how does this happen? In our modern area of GPS and maps and Google Earth, this still happens, and it still happens frequently. The wrong stuff gets put in the tank. The wrong coordinates get entered into the sprayer. Something goes wrong, and after you do all this other stuff, if that's wrong, it's obviously not going to be a good application. And then failure to clean the sprayer properly. I'm not going to work touch any more on it other than just mentioning it. But as we start in, in Illinois, we're starting to really deal with the glyphosate resistance. More and more herbicides we're having to use to deal with that. As we add more products into the mix, different degrees of susceptibility to those products as far as our crops are concerned, we want to make sure we're getting that sprayer cleaned out. But what I'm going to be really focusing in on here as far as misapplication is that bottom one, drift. Now, droplet size. I mentioned this earlier. Droplet size is important. It impacts two different things, coverage and spray drift. Coverage is good. I want to cover the spray target to have an effective application. Drift is bad. I obviously want to keep my spray on the target. I don't want it drifting off site. The issue is, is that small droplets provide better coverage, but these are also the ones that are more likely to drift. And I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes so talking about this relationship between coverage and drift. But the key to this is we have to try to achieve a balance. When you're listening to all this information, what you should catch on is the things that I would do to increase efficacy, have a more effective application, can increase my risk of drift. And the things that I would do to reduce my risk of drift could also potentially reduce my efficacy. So it's not as simple as just doing one thing and everything gets better. We're having to try to find a balance for our application. Droplet size. We measure our spray droplets by their diameter, the distance from one side to the other. The unit of measurement we use is a micron. One micron is equal to 125 thousandths of an inch. That doesn't mean anything to anyone. So the way I remember this, and I remember this because it's painful, I have none, the human hair is 100 microns in diameter. So if I had hair, it would be about 100 microns in diameter. And keep that number in mind, I'm gonna be bringing up different graphs and stuff that show different droplet sizes. That's your reference point. If I wasn't bald, I'd have hair that was 100 microns in diameter. Another really important concept is, is that all nozzles produce a range of droplet sizes. We talk about making this perfect droplet size, and I can give you some droplet sizes I think would be really good for a lot of applications, but I can't just make that one droplet size. When I atomize spray, I have a range of droplet sizes. I'll get the size I want, but I'm gonna have smaller droplets and larger droplets. We have to deal with that whole range. 
That's the droplet size spectrum. There are a couple different ways we can talk about the droplet size spectrum. One of them that you might hear is the volume median diameter, the VMD. The VMD is the droplet diameter where half the spray volume comes out in small droplets, half the volume comes out in bigger droplets. What's this mean? Let's say that cube is 10 gallons. So all the spray in that cube is 10 gallons. My VMD, let's say it's 400 microns. It's that middle point there. So this five gallons, this half of the cube, came out in droplets smaller than 400 microns. This five gallons on the right side came out in droplets bigger than 400 microns. Are there more little droplets or more bigger droplets? There's more little ones. It's not the median based on number of droplets. You don't apply a fixed number of droplets per acre. The label doesn't say apply in 10 million droplets per acre. It says apply in 10 gallons per acre. We're interested in how the volume is distributed, not the number of droplets. So it's the median, but it's based on volume. Easiest way to think about it, it's your average droplet size. If you read a label and the label says apply using a 400 micron droplet, you would be trying to set up your sprayer so that the VMD was as close as you could get to 400 microns. Another way we can describe the droplet spectrum is the percentage of spray volumes consisting of small droplets. So you will see this denoted in some of my slides as percent V less than 100 microns. What that means is all, of all the spray that comes out of that nozzle, over how many gallons is being pushed out, what percentage of the volume, again, we're interested in the volume, is coming out in droplets smaller than 100 microns. And that 100 microns is our drift cutoff point. That's the ones we're saying we are most concerned about being at risk for drift. You will see different numbers used for this depending on the researcher, the registrant, the chemical, the company, but usually it's going to be between 100 and 200 microns. Some groups use 200 microns. The EPA is focused in on 141 microns. Uh, Monsanto and BASF, when they're talking about uh, drift reduction for the new formulations of dicamba, they use 150 microns. I tend to use 100 microns. It's all the same concept. What's the diameter we're talking about? And it's the percentage volume that's at that droplet size or smaller. It's the driftable fines. What, we're, what the industry is trying to move towards are these, though, droplet spectrum categories. Has anybody ever seen these? Either on your nozzle manufacturer's catalog, on a pesticide label. This is the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers Standard S572, droplet spectrum classification. We have extremely fine all the way to ultra coarse. So small droplet spectrum to the biggest droplet spectrum. Each one of these categories has an acronym and a color code. And I'll show you how we use that later. Just as a reference point, here is a VMD range taken from one measurement system for these different classification categories. So if a label told you you needed a medium droplet spectrum, you would know the VMD is going to be somewhere between 250 and 350 microns. Make sense? It's, they look at more than just the VMD when they classify the nozzle, but I like to have numbers out there just as a reference point. So ultra coarse VMD would be greater than 650 microns. How do you use this? We'll get to the calibration process later, but when you're trying to determine, well, all right, bald guy from U of I said, worry about droplet size. How do I know what droplet size do I need? Start with the pesticide label. In this case, we're looking at a Callisto GT label. You can see there it says medium to coarse droplet size. So under our application section, it's specifically telling us what droplet spectrum to use. It's got some language in here saying that uh, certain nozzles might work better, certain nozzles might not work as well. But really the key is you have to use a medium or coarse droplet spectrum when you're applying this product. More and more pesticide labels are going to, you know, if you haven't seen this already, you <coughs> will see this on the labels. If you're working with a product where the label does not specifically tell you what droplet spectrum, this is kind of a general recommendation chart. We've got I haven't added the extremely fine or the ultra coarse. It just has very fine and extremely coarse on here. But different types of pesticides, all the way from contact insecticide, fungicide, to an incorporated soil applied herbicide, 
The check mark means as a general rule, again, check your label, but as a general rule, we would recommend these droplet spectrums for applying those types of products. The key thing you should note here is for contact products and insecticide, fungicide products, smaller droplet size as we move over towards the herbicide and towards the soil incorporated, we get to bigger droplets. The key for this is trying to balance. I said earlier, we're trying to balance coverage and efficacy and drift mitigation. So what about coverage? Why do small droplets improve coverage? If I have one 500 micron droplet there, so I've got a droplet 500 microns in diameter, if I cut that diameter in half to 250 microns, how many 250 micron droplets can I get out of that one 500 micron droplet? Two. Obvious, right? I'm cutting it in half, I get two. Except it's not. Because it's a diameter, but it's a, that's the distance from one side to the other, but it's a circle. So we cut it, cut it in half that way. We're actually also cut it, so maybe it's four, but it's not four, it's eight, because this isn't just a circle, it's a sphere. <laughs> so I get eight. Two, yeah, and I got a lot of trick questions. Basically, if I ask a question, and you think you know the answer, there's probably a reason I'm asking it. My family hates me. That's why I have to leave the state to talk. I get eight 250 micron droplets. If I do it again, I go from 100 or 250 to 125 micron droplets. Now I have 64 droplets. And the key again, volume of liquid in all three of those is the same. The volume of liquid in these 64 droplets is the same as these eight 250 droplets. 250 micron droplets, and it's the same volume of liquid as in this one 500 micron droplet. Remember, you don't apply so many droplets per acre, you apply so many gallons of spray per acre. So if you're doing 10 gallons per acre, do you want to do 10 gallons per acre like that, like that, or like that? Which is going to provide the best coverage? Which is going to provide the best efficacy? If you've got dense foliage, if you've got tall plants, with the smaller droplets, you've got more droplets to spread out on that target. If, I, I, should, I did this the same the last time I gave this talk. I should ask this question first. But pretend you have not just seen that slide. Just go back in time five minutes. And I tell you, you're going to make an application, and you've got to increase coverage. What you did last time didn't work. We've got to increase coverage. What are you going to do to increase coverage? How many would have said, well, I'm going to increase my spray volume. I'm going to use more gallons of spray per acre. That's the most common way that we see described for a lot of people to, to increasing the spray, the spray box, the coverage. We can decrease droplet size. So if we want to increase coverage, we can reduce our droplet size. You just saw how that worked. Or we, we could increase that spray application rate, gallons per acre. <coughs> Give you two examples here. Number one, we're applying 20 gallons per acre. And let's say we're using 500 micron droplets. Now I told you earlier we can never make every droplet the exact same size. Just for a hypothetical example here though, we're gonna, we're gonna say every droplet's 500 microns. Number two, we're doing five gallons per acre, but we're using 250 micron droplets. Which of those two examples is gonna provide more coverage? Well, if number one, 500 micron droplets at 20 gallons per acre, I'm gonna have 1.2 billion droplets that I can spread out on every acre. For this example, example two, I'm gonna have 2.3 billion. It's actually twice as much as is due to rounding there. It's twice as much, 2.3 billion droplets per acre. What's the other difference between one and two? What else is different about these droplets? When you apply a pesticide, you have two rates on the label, right? You've got a spray application rate. That's this here. What's your other application rate? Product. You apply so much product per acre. So between these two spray solutions, there's more spray here, but what, what is there really more of? Water. There's no more, this, this, this is, whatever, the six fluid ounces, that's an example I use. This is gonna have six fluid ounces per acre, so does this. This is four times as diluted. So not only do I have more droplets, they're also more concentrated. The other issue, it's not just number of droplets, it's getting them there and getting them to stay on the plant surface. 
fine, tend to put deposit more efficiently than medium or coarse, then we need to get there. We're going we're to get to that. We're going to talk about drift. It doesn't do us any good if we have six trillion droplets, but they all blow over to the next county. There's a lot of them, but they, they, and they provide good coverage somewhere, but not on the target area. The problem with large <coughs> droplets is they bounce, they rebound, they shed, or they don't deposit on the target as well. <coughs> The target itself has a big impact on that. You know, the size of the leaf, is the leaf flat? Is it hanging down? Is it got a lot of hair on it? Is it a very waxy cuticle? All of those things will impact this. So there is no one droplet size that works best for every plant. A lot of this you've got to think about the individual targets. Any questions so far? We've talked about coverage. Now we're going to flip it. Now we're going to talk about drift. So we said, okay. We're excited about small droplets now, right? They provide good coverage, they deposit well, we're gonna, we're gonna get good efficacy. But small droplets drift more. So this is the examples from a wind, uh, wind tunnel study done in Ohio, it was an Ohio State University Extension and a USDA lab there. They varied the wind speed for this one between two and 10 miles per hour. And they measured the downwind drift distance so from zero to 60 feet on this vertical axis of how far these droplets drifted downwind. Now they did not use a standard nozzle, they used a uniform droplet generator that just drops individual droplets of an exact size. So our, our conditions were 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 60% relative humidity, one and a half foot boom height. We'll start out here with our 300 micron droplet. Do 300 micron droplets drift? Am I worried about those? No. What about a 200 micron droplet? Eh, a wee bit. You know, in a 10 mile an hour wind, it's, it's still less than a foot. I mean, it's moving, but I really don't consider that drift. That's it's not, it's probably not gonna leave the target area. What about the 150 micron droplet? It's starting to move some, but even in the 10 mile an hour wind, it's still only about five feet. So really, I'm just worried about that last pass along the downwind edge, right? And if I'm really concerned about it, I just make that pass another time. That's really, you know, it's moving, but not a considerable amount. What happens when I go to the 100 micron droplet though? Now we start to see movement. In just a two mile an hour wind, we're about four feet downwind, all the way to about 18 feet in a 10 mile an hour wind. That's why I use the 100 micron droplet as my cutoff point. Yes, this is moving, but it's not something that I can't manage in other ways. This, it starts to become an issue. What about the 50 micron droplet? Very high risk of drift. Two mile an hour wind, 18 feet downwind, all the way to 55 feet in a 10 mile an hour wind. So much higher. So you can see there what happens. You know, we always talk about wind speed, but it's it's all related to the size of the spray droplets. The smaller, and you all knew this, smaller droplets are more prone to drift, but this just shows you, put some numbers to it. So you actually see what happens as we reduce that droplet size and how it increases drift distance. What are the things that dominate drift in terms of weather? Just mentioned one, wind speed, right? We always talk about wind speed, wind direction. The one thing that does not get mentioned enough is stability. And when I say stability, what most people are thinking about there is that term inversion. Hopefully you've all heard to not spray during inversion. Well, why? St stable conditions, and we're referring to atmospheric stability there, occur when we're, not, when we're under an inversion. We, have, we say the atmosphere is stable. What we don't have is any vertical air mixing. Unstable conditions, that's our normal temperature profile, that would be about, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The warmest air is at the Earth's surface. As, it gets, as you go up in altitude, what happens to the temperature? It gets colder. What does warm air do? It rises. So you've got this vertical air mixing. When we make the, I'm gonna back up here, 50 microns, 50 microns is still, mm, it's still big enough, it's gonna to fall towards the target. But once you get much smaller than 50 microns, say 25 microns, you start to get into dust sized particles. They don't fall to the target. They're gonna hang suspended in the air. So when we're spraying in the normal profile, we have that vertical air mixing, that vertical component of the heat takes those droplets up and away from our target area so they can't drift off target. When we spray during that inversion, we have no vertical air mixing. You've all seen fog early in the morning, right? What is fog? 
little tiny water droplets, moisture, smaller than 25 microns. When you look at a patch of fog, what is the one thing the fog is not doing? It's not moving. Well, why doesn't the fog fall to the ground? I just gave it away, it's too light. Gravity can't pull it down. The fog is not moving horizontally, why? There's no, pardon? So no, no air No, no air movement. there's no wind, yeah. And it's not rising because we're under an inversion condition. There's no vertical air movement. When you spray during those time periods, the little tiny spray droplets you make, and even if you're using an air induction nozzle with a drift reduction adjuvant, you can still make some fine droplets. They remain suspended, and the key is they're in concentration. They don't disperse themselves. So when they move off target, it's in mass. What do we know about really small droplets in terms of deposition? They work really well. So wherever they end up, you could end up having a problem. We see that wind speed, you know, we always talk about wind speed, wind speed for drift. Wind speed has the greatest influence on near field drift. What do I mean? Quarter mile. Within a quarter mile, if, you're if you've got something that's a quarter mile away or closer, your biggest thing that you should be worried about is your wind speed. But when we talk about great far field drift, other things that drift that's occurring more than a quarter mile away, that stability becomes a more important factor. How stable is the atmosphere? The picture you're looking at here is, is smoke released from an aircraft. So we flew, we, we flew the, the field this direction, and at this point and that point, we released smoke. You all seen an air show where they, they do the stunts and, they, and the, the plane lets out that smoke. Ag aircraft can do the same thing. They dump paraffin oil onto the exhaust, it blows smoke. They use it to evaluate weather conditions. And what you can see here is we, we do have some horizontal component of it, but do you think that's very strong? No. It's, you know, this was taken, we were up in the turn already, so we get this slow creep of the smoke downwind. What about vertical movement? Hardly any. See that plume right there? Something's going on right there. That We've got a little bit of vertical air mixing right there. This was about taken, I think, about 8 o'clock in the morning. This is that time period during the day when our inversion is just starting to lift but hasn't really lifted yet. So if you're spraying, and we weren't spraying, we were out you know, messing around taking these pictures, any little water droplets he would have released, the exact same thing would have been happening to him. Creeping off target in mass. This was a study done at College Station, Texas. It's an air application research unit. They measured, they're measured drift. So our horizontal axis here is downwind distance. Zero was the release point, all the way to 100 meters downwind. Vertical, uh, vertical axis is deposition of a tracer die. They use this fluorescent die to measure drift. So it's micrograms per square centimeter. So the higher the, the bar, the more drift. The Solid line was our low wind speed conditions, one to two and a half miles an hour. The dashed line was higher, and they, it wasn't quite as high as they wanted. <coughs> two and a half to three and a half miles an hour. Before, we, but 75 meters and closer, which of the two is the higher amount of drift? The higher wind speed, right? That wind speed is, because the wind is blowing higher, we've got more drift. What happens once we hit 75 meters and we go out? There's no difference anymore. Why? Because these were, and that's, that's why this didn't get much higher. They tried to do this under the exact same atmospheric stability condition. <coughs> In other words, this was a stable atmosphere. At this point, that atmospheric stability becomes the dominant factor determining how much drift is going there. So I'm not saying don't worry about wind speed. You have to worry about wind speed and wind direction, but also play, think about atmospheric stability. Don't spray during an inversion. This is when they occur. And the exact times here, I forgot to mention this earlier, the exact times I'm telling you here are gonna vary depending on where you're at and what time of the year it is. This was studied down in Texas. They had four, three or four MET stations set up through different parts of the state and they monitored this for, I think, three months. Red bar is very stable conditions, or green bar is very stable conditions, red bar is stable conditions. So very stable and stable. Is that good for spraying? No. Remember, stability is the opposite of what you want your family members. You want stable family members, stable friends. When you're spraying, unstable. 
Well, unstable is where we have that vertical learn mix. Like I know it sounds the opposite. Anytime you say stable or unstable, we always want to pick stable, right? Stable, it sounds better. Not when you're spraying. When you're spraying atmosphere, stable is bad. These are very calm conditions. Red, or green and red, very calm, no vertical air mixing. Yellow, the tan is neutral. There, there's, there's, it's in between. Blue is unstable. That blue means we, we've got that vertical air mixing. So if we start at midnight till about 6 a.m., and again, this is for Texas for three months, so the times are gonna vary depending on where you're at and what time of the year it is. But between midnight and 6 a.m., what dominates? Stable and very stable. Not a good time to spray. 7 o'clock, what do we see? We see a shift. We see all, and I should, so this is the average over this three-month period. We see a mixture. What's happening? Ground is starting to warm up. We're going to unstable. And then from about 8 to about 5 o'clock, we see unstable conditions. This is when we want to spray. That's when we have our vertical air mixing. We get to a point at dusk, late, late afternoon, we shift back over and the atmosphere gets stable again. So don't spray under those stable inversion conditions. Droplet evaporation. <coughs> this is 200, 150 micron droplets. So the green bar is the initial droplet size. When it came out of the nozzle, how big was it? The blue and red bar, are the final droplet diameters after it fell, I think it was two feet. Blue is at 50 degree Fahrenheit, red is at 86 degree Fahrenheit. What we're trying to measure here is evaporation. You've all heard before that evaporation, hot, dry conditions, increase the risk of drift, right? You, you shrink that droplet. Well, how, how important is this? How big a role does it have? What about 200 micron droplets? Does evaporation have much impact on 200 micron droplets? No. 50 microns, there's no reduction in droplet diameter. Even at 86 degrees Fahrenheit, there's a slight reduction in the diameter, but pretty much that droplet is the same size when it landed as when it came out of the nozzle. What about a 100 micron droplet? Does evaporation impact the, the 100 micron droplet? Yes, very much so. Even in 50 degree Fahrenheit, we see a significant reduction in the diameter. It's down to about 95 microns. We increase the temperature. Increased temperature, what happens to evaporation? You increase evaporation. So the diameter, the droplet shrinks even more. It's down to about 85 microns. So now we see a considerable reduction in droplet diameter. What else is getting reduced along with the diameter? The weight, the size of the droplet. Remember that graph earlier? As this gets smaller, it gets more prone to drift. It can, it's more at risk for drift and it's going to get carry greater differences. What about a 50 micron droplet? Does evaporation affect a 50 micron droplet? Very much so. There's essentially nothing you can do to protect it. Even at 50 degrees, 86 degrees, no impact. That droplet, and, and the droplet evaporated completely when it was 50 microns. The key to this is this is water only. There was no pesticide or any other kind of agent. This was water only. Obviously, if you add an oil-based component to this, you're going to start changing. But evaporation does have an impact, but a lot of times you'll, you'll hear this overall statement that it does this. Well, what it does depends on the size of the drop when you're talking about. Boom height. This is something that we're talking a lot about in Illinois with the coming of the dicam to the 240 tolerant crops. Boom height and its impact on drift. Same study you saw earlier, same wind tunnel. This vertical axis is still the same. Drift distance, downwind drift distance, zero to 60 feet. Now the horizontal axis instead of wind speed is boom height. One, uh, half a foot, 0.5 feet, all the way to three feet. Conditions for this one were 65 degrees temperature, 50% relative humidity. This was all done in a 10 mile hour wind. So before we looked at that 300 micron droplet, we said we weren't worried about it as far as drift, right? That was at one and a half foot boom height. What if we increase the boom height to three feet? We're still not super worried about it. But we do see now that we can actually get it to drift a little bit. Why? It's 300 microns, the wind is 10 mile an hour, what's the difference? The boom height. When you increase the boom height, what are you doing? You're increasing the travel time and the exposure. That droplet is now more exposed to the wind because it has to travel farther. We go to the 200 micron droplet, another one we weren't really worried about before, but now if we increase that boom height to three feet, now we're at 18 feet. 
we go to the 100, and you'll see this, the same trend. As we reduce droplet size, the curve just gets steeper, right? As we increase boom height, we see more and more drift. Let's look at that 100 micron droplet. Before, we we're at one and a half feet, we're about 18 feet drift distance. When we take that up to three feet boom height, now we're looking at 50 foot about for drift distance. So boom height is it's, it's often overlooked. We I talk about adjuvants and nozzle types. The height of the release point, the boom height, is also important for reducing drift. What about that 50 micron droplet? What happened there? As I go from half a foot to one foot, I see what I expect, right? I get a sharp increase in drift distance. But between one foot and three feet, nothing. Why? It's already suspended and leaving. Pretty much close. It's water only. It evaporated. That, that, that's about the last part to point that they could see it. But if it had an oil in it, you'd be dead on. In other words, if it has an oil in it, it's not going to evaporate. It's just it's going to stay there and, and who knows how far it can go. I bring this up. This is something, again, it's overlooked. A lot of times we're talking about nozzles, adjuvants, boom height. Where should you be when you're spraying? You should be looking in your nozzle catalog to determine your optimum boom height. And it's based on your fan angle and your nozzle spacing. Not sure about out here, but in Illinois, the 110 degree uh, flat fan nozzle is very common. Uh, 20 inch centers, in other words, 20 inches between the nozzles has been common. They've been moving more to 15 inch centers. But if I'm using a 110 degree nozzle, and my nozzles are 20 inches apart, I should be 16 to 18 inches above the target. So that boom should be about one and a half feet above the target. And if I drive around, you think about here, I know in my area, if I drive around the fields, in May and June, one of the things I don't see very often is a boom at that height. And I all, we all know why, you know, there's, there's, you've got 100, 120 foot booms, you're trying to move as fast as possible, you're worried about knocking nozzles off, you're worried about boom sway, all those things. And I'll be honest, I, I grew up on a farm in Northern Illinois. And I always tell everyone the reason I didn't stay on the farm is that my, where I'm from got engulfed by Chicago. But the truth of the matter is, the reason I didn't stay on the farm is you give me about five minutes in any piece of machinery, and I've run it into something. So I'm sympathetic to the reason why everybody wants to keep that boom higher. I understand that. What I'm trying to tell you is, you can buy yourself a lot of drift reduction by trying to get that boom as close as you can to the target. All right, nozzles and droplet size. We talked about droplet size, how important it is for both coverage and drift reduction. How does the nozzle impact it? Well, the nozzle design. I'm going to briefly go over the different nozzle types. Orifice size. Smaller orifice makes smaller droplets, bigger orifice makes bigger droplets. Pressure, you've all heard this before. We know if we reduce pressure, big droplets increase pressure, we make smaller droplets. And then the fan angle. I don't ever spend much time on this, but the fan angle does have an impact. If I've got three nozzles all the same size and same type, one's 65, one's 80, and 100, one's 110 degree fan angle, the 65 degree fan angle will have the biggest droplet size as I go from the 80 to the 110. I'm going to reduce my droplet size slightly. Here's, a, here's some pictures just showing you just the droplet size out of uh, four different nozzles. Start here with the extended range, and I just put the pictures up here. It's hard to tell stuff from a picture, but just as a talking, something to look at, we're talking about them. Extended range nozzles, smallest droplet size basically out of all your flat fan nozzle designs. Really good for coverage, good for insecticide, fungicide applications, higher risk of drift. Will they work for herbicides? Will they work for herbicides? Well, it depends on your version of work. If you mean control the pest, yes. If you mean drift reduction, no. And remember, it's your thing, well, it's, it's, it's that balance. It's a small droplet size. It'll effectively control weeds, but your risk of drift is higher. We move to, this is the Turbo T-Jet, but it's a pre-orifice nozzle. The Drift Guard, Turbo T-Jet, a lot of our Wilger nozzles are all pre-orifice nozzles. They use the pre-orifice to meter and exit orifice to form the final droplet size. It's a bigger droplet size. Good all around nozzle, good for insecticides, fungicides, herbicide applications. Reduce risk of drift from the extended range. But we go to the air induction nozzle, we've got an even larger droplet size. Use that Venturi action mix the air and spray in the chamber together, got an even larger droplet size, fewer fines than with the pre-orifice nozzle. This last one over here, this is the Turbo T-Jet induction, it's just another newer design of air induction nozzle, 
really, really large droplets. So as I move from here across and then down, I'm seeing a reduction in drift, but an also potential reduction in efficacy, right? Reducing coverage. And this is, I like numbers and graphs better than pictures. So this is kind of highlighting all those things I've talked about. We got two different pressures, 40 and 60 PSI. The vertical axis is percent volume less than 100 microns. So it's showing you out of these nozzles, what percentage of the spray volume came out in droplets smaller than 100 microns. So the, the higher the bar, the higher the risk of what? Drift, all right. We got three nozzle types. The pink and red are extended range. The, the tan and yellow are the turbo T-jet, our pre-orifice nozzle. And our two greens are turbo drop, that's an air induction. So extended range, pre-orifice, air induction. Let's just look at the pressure. Overall, as I go from 40 to 60 PSI, what happens to my fines? I get an increase in fines. Let's focus in on the 40. As I go from extended range to pre-orifice <coughs> to air induction, what happens to my fines? Decrease. Dramatically decrease. These nozzle designs do work to reduce the fine droplets. You know, you look at that 04 extended range, I go from 20% to about 2.5%. Spray volume less than 100 microns, and that occurs at both the 40 and 60. What about orifice size? So look at the extended range. As I go from the 02 to the 04 at either pressure, what happens to the amount of fines? They go down. Bigger orifice, bigger droplet. Same thing with the turbo T-jet, right? 02 to 04. 02 to 04. What about the air induction nozzle? It's the opposite. And there, this, this is not the only air induction design that does this. Overall, as a general rule, you should still figure that your air induction nozzles also get bigger droplet sizes as you use bigger orifices. I don't have time to go into it, but when they design an air induction nozzle, that final exit orifice, they can vary the size of it. And so when they're designing them, they're actually trying to get it so that the whole range of orifice sizes they offer have pretty much very similar droplet sizes. But as a general rule, we still say bigger orifice, bigger droplet size. So we, we look at this, we're making an application, we're worried about drift, we see that reduction in fines and we're excited about this, right? That looks good. We're reducing our risk of drift. This is the same exact nozzle, same pressures, <coughs> Uh, same orifice sizes, now the vertical axis is at volume, median, diameter in microns. Average droplet size, if you will. This is going to be, a, well, hopefully my st statistics teacher won't listen to this and hear me call that the average, but it, it's really the, the easiest way to think about it. Now, look what happens. I like, this, I like the air induction nozzles because of reduction in drift, but look at what happens to that VMB. It's much higher than the other nozzles. What's that do for efficacy? <coughs> Possibly nothing. It depends on the product and the plant. You know, some products are still going to work really well even with a droplet size that big. But I know no matter what, I've got fewer droplets and it's going to have a harder time keeping them to stay on the plant. That's that balance. I'm not saying either one is good or bad. You just need to be aware of what's happening when you change these things. So how do we do this? How do we calibrate the sprayer then? Hopefully everybody's familiar with this equation. This is the equation we use to determine the flow rate we need for an application. So I'm going to say I'm in an application, I'm going to apply 15 gallons per acre. Let's say I'm traveling 7 miles an hour on average and my nozzles are 20 inches apart. So I take the 20 gallons per acre multiplied by the 7 miles per hour multiplied by my 20 inches divided by my constant 5,940. I need a flow rate of 0.35 gallons per minute out of my nozzle. Hopefully everyone has done this math before. This is how you determine the flow rate you need for your nozzle. I'm gonna use a turbo T-jet nozzle. I know that I need a flow rate of 0.35 gallons per minute. And I'm going back to that label I showed you earlier. I need a medium or coarse droplet spectrum. I've got some hard to control weeds, so I'm gonna use a medium droplet spectrum. How do I get that? Here's my nozzle catalog table for the turbo T-Jet. A lot of information there. I'm going to focus in on, you know, the, these, these major blocks are my orifice sizes, right? The 01 orifice all the way to the 08 orifice. Small orifice to big orifice. I'm going to focus in on that 03 there. 
And the five most important columns, the first one there is the, the orifice size. So these are all, this is all for the O3 orifice. Pressure range, 15 to 90 PSI. Here's the droplet size. This is where that droplet spectral classification comes into play. This tells me, say at 40 PSI, this nozzle is going to make a coarse droplet size. <coughs> Here is the flow rate in gallons and fluid ounces per minute. So if I choose the TT11003 and I operate it at 54 PSI, I'm going to generate that flow rate at 0.35 gallons per minute. Now the 0.35 is not right in there. I've used another formula. I know it's going to be between somewhere between 50 and 60 PSI, right? My 0.35 is somewhere in there, and it's actually at 54 PSI. I'm going to generate that flow rate, and I'm going to make my medium droplet spectrum. That is how you take that droplet size information from the label and make sure you select and set up your equipment to provide that droplet size. It's flow rate plus droplet size. Flow control systems. Almost everybody uses rate controllers now, right? How do they work? They vary the pressure to maintain the gallons per acre. Another example. Say our nozzles are 20 inches apart, we're doing 10 gallon per acre, we set up for 13 miles an hour. We run that same math, we need a flow rate of 0.44 gallons per minute. I go back to my chart. In this case, I'm going to focus in on the 04 orifice, so TT11004. If I operate that at 48 PSI, I'm going to get the flow rate I need of 0.44 gallons per minute, and I'm going to be generating a coarse droplet size. Still on label for that example label I showed you earlier, right? It's in medium or coarse. So I'm still on label, making the right droplet size. Can I increase speed to 18 miles an hour? And I really don't know what fields are like out here in, in Illinois, some of the flat fields. This is easily doable. I get guys that they'll admit to doing that fast, 18 <laughs> miles an hour. So that's just five mile an hour increase in speed. How many of you think we can do that? Well, nozzles are still 20 inches apart. We're still applying 10 gallons per acre. So if we're going to go faster, and I want to maintain 10 gallons per acre, what do I have to do? What's, what's the flow control system going to do? Increase the pressure. Now the flow rate has to be 0 0.61. I've got to go from 0.44 to 0.61. That's not that much. Except it is that much. Now I need to operate that nozzle at 93 PSI. So just a 5 mile an hour change in speed, I went from 48 to 93 PSI. You say, well. 90 PSI here to medium, that's still on label. You're probably close to being on label. So is that what you're going to tell the regulator then when you get busted for a drift complaint? I was pretty close, I think, to being on label. You don't know. Chances are you've actually broken into the fine droplet spectrum category. The point is you operated the nozzle above a pressure limit it was designed to be. <laughs> the other thing we see is <coughs> not changing the speed, but the gallon breaker. Again, here's our setup. 20 inches, trying to apply 12 and a half gallons per acre, average speed 10 miles an hour. And again, these numbers might be different for you, but the concept holds. Doesn't matter what the numbers are locally here. So you need a flow rate of 0.42 gallons per minute, going to my extended range nozzle. If I select the 05 extended range and operate it at 28 PSI, I'm going to get that flow rate, but we make it a medium droplet size. Well, didn't get a very good application the first time, so I'm going to increase my spray volume. I'm going to go from 12 and a half to 20 gallons per acre. And I don't need, guess what? I don't need, that, the, the, the extension guy talked about changing orifice size. He's a moron. I got a computer. I, I don't have to change nozzles. I just tell the computer, delete 12.5, enter in 20. Bam! Now it's 20 gallons per acre. Which is magic. Well, my speed is still 10 miles an hour. I didn't have to change my nozzles. Just tell the computer, right? The computer says, well, we're going to do 20 gallons per acre now. It says we need a flow rate of 0.67 gallons per minute. Well, same as before now, though, we have to operate that nozzle at 72 PSI. Again, we're off, we're, we're, over the, we're over the upper limit of the nozzle. Are we fine? Are we very fine? We don't know. The point is it's a much smaller droplet spectrum than that medium that I started out with. I'm going to skip through this. Drift, con drift control additives, drift reduction additives. The key is we're adding them to the spray tank to try to make the droplet size larger, right? This is an example of without drift reduction adjuvant, and this is with. You can see there the sheet stays intact a lot longer. 
much bigger droplet size. The surfactants, how important are surfactants? This, this, this series of pictures shocked me for two reasons. Didn't really surprise me that surfactants were important. This is, uh, these top four are 297 micron droplets, so three times the hair I wish I had, 266 microns and 312. So they, they were targeting for around a 300 micron droplet. So the top there, A, is no surfactant, water only. What happens to that droplet? Bing, it spreads out, but then it rebounds and bounces off the plant. No deposition. Second, the middle row is at a quarter percent concentration of surfactant. What happens? Hits the target plant, spreads out, but still, it rebounds and bounces. It's not till they get a, to a half a percent concentration that they get the drop with the and first impact. Yes, it, it might impact later on as it continues to roll on the plant leaf, but how many of those droplets are you not keeping? When we get to the half a percent concentration, we get what we want. That droplet hits the plant leaf and spreads out and deposits. That wasn't very surprising. What surprised me with it was this top one. Had, before I had seen these pictures, I would have told you this was probably occurring around five or 600 microns. But this is 300 micron droplet not being retained on a plant leaf. Now obviously it shows you the importance of surfactant. It also shows you what happens with large droplets. You know, think back to that introduction where we got a 450, 500 micron VMB. What's happening to those droplets? <laughs> we did, I've done several years of research for you know, looking at the dicamba uh, tolerant soybeans and applications. This was a 2011 study. This was droplet size from our different treatments. The vertical axis is percent spray volume less than 100 microns. So again, our risk of drift. We've got five different nozzle types, starting out with the extended range to a turbo T-jet, so a pre-orifice nozzle, and then three different types of air induction nozzles. The none, the green bar, it says none, but it actually still had the Weathermax, Clarity, and AMS. So all these spray solutions, we actually measure droplet size with the herbicides in the, in the mixture. A lot of times when you see droplet size, it's been water only. We wanted to know what the herbicide itself did. And then the other four bars are with different drift reduction adjuvants. Interlock, which is an oil-based one. Control, which is a synthetic polymer. And Array and Border, which are guar gum-based polymers. So first of all, just looking overall at all five of the spray solutions, as I go from extended range to the air induction, I see what I saw before, right? A reduction in fine droplets with nozzle technology. What about the drift reduction adjuvants? Do they work? Yes, drift reduction adjuvants do work to reduce fines. Which one's the best? Depends on the nozzle. You know, in this case, it was interlock. This case is with control. One of them was with array, one of them was with border. Every nozzle is different. One thing I hear in Illinois quite a bit is drift reduction adjuvants don't work with air induction nozzles. There's an air induction nozzle. Did the drift reduction adjuvant work to reduce drift? Yes, all four of them. To varying degrees, but they still reduce drift. <laughs> Again, we get excited. We say, well, we're looking, we're looking down here at this TTI with the control or the border. We're really reducing our drift. This is what happens to the VMB, volume, median, diameter, and microns. This is our average droplet size. So we've seen that reduction of fines. The thing that accompanies it is overall we're increasing our droplet size. Again, not saying either one's good or bad. Just be aware. What is the product you're applying? What's your target look like? What is, you know, you want to do everything you can to reduce the fine droplets and lower your risk of drift, but you also want to make sure you're making an effective application. <coughs> Pulse width modulation. This is an electronic system that allows you to maintain pressure throughout flow rate changes. I'm going to skip through some of this. I'm going to get to the, I was asked to talk a little bit about aerial application. Droplet size is really important also with aerial application. A lot of it is, is related to the wind shear. We're releasing spray into high speed air. That dominates the droplet size. And I'm going to skip to the point, the one question that everybody wants to know about. The, the, the topic when we bring up aerial application is probably on everybody's mind, is do those low volume applications work? So this was research done by Ken Asley at the University of Minnesota for soybean aphid applications. So this chart over here on the left is aphid density. Seven days after the application, they put on Warrior. So the blue is one gallon, the blue is aerial at one gallon per acre, yellow is air at four gallons per acre, green is ground at 20 gallons per acre. The chart on the right 
Same treatments except now they added the untreated here. This is the final yield in bushels per acre. Which of those treatments work the best at controlling aphids? One gallon and it's, it's very significantly fewer aphids and significantly higher yield. Now that E means it's an electrostatic, that's the type of spray system, but overall, do you think that we need to add more water to control pests? Is that necessarily the best way to get more coverage? No. Uh, earlier I was asked, and I didn't include in the slide, Nathan asked if I had any data on depositing on wheat heads. And there was a study done, it was a cooperation between North Dakota State University and Texas. They looked at two, five, and 10 gallon per acre. Out of those three application rates, which was the one had the, what do you think had the worst deposition on wheat heads? Let me say two, five or ten. It was a ten. The ten was significantly worse. So there was no difference between two or five gallons per acre. So the key is figure out what you're applying, what droplet size do you need, and set your equipment up to produce that droplet size. This was a study. And with that, I'm a little bit over. Any questions? Questions? Thank you very much, Scott.